our guests here, uh, uh, Jarrett McCloskey and uh, Wojciech Pilisek are here, uh, because you see some games uh, have an ambition. They have an ambition to be a really good first-person shooter, to be a really good real-time strategy game, and some other projects have a much bigger ambition than that. Uh, let's take a look at uh, next-gen uh, multiplayer game development by our next uh, speakers. Welcome them to, <laughs> welcome them to the stage. How about that? Awesome. All right. Cool. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Great to see you all. First of all, uh, truly, a thank you to everyone here, um, not just here at the conference, literally, but everyone who's contributed to Godot, because truly, we would not be here without you all, uh, from the contributions, of course, to the entire code base, to um, Ariel Manzur, to Juan, um, the create co-founders of Godot. It's been absolutely amazing to work with it. Uh, so thank you so much for allowing us to do this. We are a team of about 10. Uh, my name is Jared McCluskey. I uh, started the Mirror roughly two years ago, so coming up on our um, second anniversary. And we've got an extremely tech-heavy team at the moment. It's largely engineering, because we've been heavy in development over the past roughly year and a half. Um, also, of course, uh, Ariel Menzer is an advisor to us, HP as well. Um, been working with a lot of names you probably know, like um, Wojtek Pei, of course, will be speaking shortly. And his, you've probably seen some of his awesome graphics, YouTube videos. Uh, Aaron Frank, a lot of core contributions to Godot. And then also some great people on the marketing side, uh, coming from brand lead for Halo and more. We also have some great investors, uh, Founders Fund, Convoy, Abstract Ventures. So, of course, a lot of games will go the publishing route, but if you just to do the venture capital route. It's pretty crazy and intense and hard, but I'm happy to be of help. So uh, pull me aside, always happy to um, do what I can to help. Uh, feel free to reach out, email me. We'll have our contact info up at the end. So what is the mirror? We've gotten this question a good bit and uh, we've morphed a bit over time and we are truly an all-in-one game development platform. That's our main focus. A lot of this inspiration came from the world of Second Life. Um, raise your hand if you've played Second Life or have worked with it a bit. Okay, we've got about 10 in here. Cool, cool. So, yeah, very OG, like, social metaverse, kind of odd, interesting, cool platform at the same time. Um, I would argue it was very much ahead of its time as a runtime game development platform because everything you did in world was at runtime. So, like, if we're making this car right here, it's not, okay, we make the scene and then build and run. It's all simultaneous. We are driving the car down the highway while we're actually making the car type of thing. It, but it really changed how I viewed game development, which is now standard for modern web apps, like you'll use Google Docs for online collaboration. But we're taking the same approach for game development to simplify the process. This is how it started. This was March 2022, just about three months with like, of course, a very early internal alpha. And this is how far we've come in the past year and a half or so. And as you can see here, we've done a lot of work on the graphics side, which Wojtek will be digging into. Uh, we have a player controller out of the box. We have height maps. We have networked physics. We are working on some out-of-the-box shooter functionality so that you can quickly create shooter games, which are some of the hardest to make. And then, of course, once we do that, you can hop to any other type of game from there. So as many of you know, of course, being in game development, it's a blast. But if you approach multiplayer in 3D, it's stupid hard, and then if you had networked physics on top of that, and everything else you need in web development, from authentication to databases, to REST APIs, net code, you name it, that's a lot of work to do, especially for one dev. So you can do it yourself and try to do all that, or maybe with a team, but then that gets expensive, both time and money-wise. Or you could build on a platform, but if you do that like with Roblox or Second Life or UEFN, then you're immediately in a walled garden. And of course, we're all here because we love open source software and we want to own our data and own what we're building on. So instead, we are building an all-in-one game platform built on top of Godot that provides all of these out of the box, but in a form that you can still own your underlying game, your 3D models, your data, and so forth. But we give you everything you need out of the box to create great multiplayer games super, super fast. So compared to other platforms, because again, this is kind of um, a bit of a zero to one product. We're akin to a next generation Roblox, but we're not focused on kids. Uh, we're not focused on that graphic style either, but much more like modern graphics. So instead of building like a Lego type game, if you want to build a more of a Call of Duty type game, which we'll talk about, we'd be the platform to do so. 
And you'll notice that we go from no code to we'll call it medium code as well. And so if you're an expert Godot dev, you're going to be down here. Uh, of course, you should still probably use Godot. We're much more targeted towards, uh, first of all, beginner devs on the no code side. But then why we're here is because of the Godot features that we have if you want to utilize the platform aspect side. So we really have those two focuses, um, which I'll dive into shortly. So of course, you're probably thinking, well, why on earth would I build in the mirror? The key thing there is uh, the platform side that I mentioned with all the features that we give you out of the box to quickly create great games. But there's a lot more coming. Uh, we haven't really talked about our roadmap much. And so thank you all for coming, because we got some cool announcements in store. So I recently did an interview. You might know Code with Tom. Uh, he's been writing, do, doing some awesome YouTube videos of game development with Godot. And so we did a, a 30 minute or so interview. Definitely recommend checking it out. But one thing I wanted to highlight is the progress that we have on the runtime game development side. So if you look at the highlighted box right there, uh, side note, I loved visual scripting. That was the reason we chose Godot, actually. So it's kind of sad to see it sunsetted. And so we were like, well, let's bring it back. And so here is visual scripting again. And everything you do, though, is uh, simultaneous, just like you're modifying something on Google Sheets, Google Docs. When you modify to one screen, it happens on the other. So you're actually real time collaborating, making the game together. And the reason for this is because, as you know, with game dev, that cycle time of getting feedback from users, testing it out with your team, shipping it, then adding new features and so forth, you want to iterate through that cycle time really quickly so that you can polish your game fast. And so the faster we can get through this cycle, the more high quality your game can be. And ultimately, even if like, you have all the skills in the world, time is such a huge factor. So we want to help you time-wise get through the loop faster. So this is inspired by like Gary's Mod, Second Life, Minecraft, again, with that real-time development aspect. So you can use the mirror then to rapidly prototype things you make in Godot. So import it into the mirror, get feedback on it, and go from there. You can build with friends, collaborate with colleagues, and ultimately this is a different way to develop games. And so one example here is the runtime Godot imports into the mirror. As I mentioned, everything is runtime. Sorry, I'm beating a dead horse there. But um, I, I want to emphasize that because we did not like import this GLB, this flashlight from Godot, and then rerun. This is all done in real time. So we import the flashlight. Say we're just like building a map together, and we're like, oh, man, it's dark. Let's import this. You create it in Godot, and then you import that. And then you can use that with your users live. And so with that a feature announcement, we are going to be working on a Godot plugin. And so you can install the plugin on Godot while you're working on a mirror game, a mirror space, an experience. And then instead of having to do that export process that you know very well, to get the GLB file, you can then just export that out, or excuse me, click the plugin, do one click there, and then that'll appear instantly in the mirror. And so this is just working with GLBs for now, but our vision is that anything created in Godot can ultimately be used in the mirror. And so with that, we're also working on a Blender plugin. So a similar workflow, depending on your role in game dev, that could be whether you're working with Godot directly or maybe you prefer 3D modeling. So we want you to also not have to do the full export process, but why not just have a one-click import into the mirror so that you can actually have screens side by side, one with a Blender, one with the mirror, working in real time with your fellow devs, and then that updates immediately. But it goes both ways, because we want you to be able to start with the mirror and end with Godot if you wish. Like I mentioned, we're not aiming to be that walled garden like Roblox and these others. If you want to build in the mirror and then end with Godot, we will be working on static exports. Now, as I mentioned, we do a lot of backend code for you, like out of the box, REST APIs, databases, authentication, et cetera. So you'll need to do some of that net code yourself. It's kind of like pulling electronics out and the wires are dangling. But we want you to be able to take that with you if you so desire. And so with that, our long-term vision is bi-directionality. So as I mentioned, you can start in the mirror and in Godot, or perhaps start in Godot and end in the mirror, depending on what workflow you would like. And you can flex with that over time. So another feature announcement we're working on is deep linking. And so of course, you make something in Godot, uh, a race car, for example. And if you want to use that car, you we will we'll need to export some kind of full game around it and upload that, say, to itch or wherever. But that's quite a process just to say, hey, try out this car I made. But it's so much simpler if you could just upload the car into a mirror space, grab a link, quickly send that to a friend, and then you click, and you're in the game. Now you can test that out. So there's a lot of different workflows here, but we want to make it as easy as possible to quickly create cool things in Godot or in the mirror and then share that. As I mentioned, we are on the visual scripting side as well. and so. I already touched on that, so let me skip to the next one, which 
I'm super excited about is the in-world GD script side. So we have visual scripting, and as I mentioned, that's the no-code side, but we go up to medium code, quote unquote, as well. So if you want to write in-world GD script, then we are working on that, and that'll also be all at runtime. This was another inspiration from Second Life, where I'd write a lot of LSL, Linen scripting language, and then you hit run, it does it in real time there. Awesome experience, we want you to have that same uh, kind of effect, similar, again, to working in Gary's mod, for example. And then, of course, we have a marketplace, and we have the same one-time transactions that many other marketplaces do, but that's kind of, it's a feature, but what we're really trying to push for, and candidly, this is something we're open to feedback on, but we want to implement an awesome rev share model. Our pricing, which you may think is, oh, here's all this out of the box, what's the cost? The cost is actually zero dollars to you as the creator. And so we follow after like YouTube, for example, where why on earth would YouTube penalize a creator for uploading something? Like, no, we want you to build in the platform. That's a great thing. And uh, we're not gonna charge you for that. So in the same vein of being bi-directional with Godot, Godot is free. We take the same approach. Well, building in the mirror is also free. So where does the monetization come in? And that's with freemium for the players. So going back to a race car, for example, say you create a racing game and your first five cars are free as the player, and then if you want the next five cars, then you need to be paying the premium subscription. And when you pay that subscription for Mirror Premium, you are getting all access to everything premium in the Mirror. And so again, kind of like Spotify in that sense, or YouTube Premium, you get full access, but then from there we pay out in a rev share model to the creators. So there's a blog post on our website that details how this is gonna roughly be broken down. As I mentioned, we're open to feedback. If you love it, if you hate it, email me, Pull me aside, I'd love to chat more about it. But as a quick example, say you create a game and then out of all the plays that are measured out, you're getting a $1,000 payout for your game. Let's say there were two game devs, Game Dev Grant and Game Dev Gloria, and then there were two artists as well, Audio Alley on the audio side and Modeler Mark on the 3D modeling side. So we do an initial 80-20 split. I, again, that's something that uh, we're finalizing, but the intent there is you can upload a lot of 3D modelers as, excuse me, a lot of assets as a 3D modeler, and then those are available for use. But of course, the game dev side is still a pretty technically heavy lift to make sure that's a good um, game that someone enjoys. So there's an even split between the game devs, which you could adjust if you agree upon that. And then with the artist split, that's by the number of assets contributed. So Audio Alley contributed two out of three. Mark contributed one out of the three assets, just as a simple example. And so that 20% is split from there. Then everyone gets paid out for the month, and then the next month starts after that. So a lot of the intent here is you're not having to do or pay all up front in order to create great games. Instead, you can just pull from the RevShare marketplace, and you're not having to pay for any hosting. You're not having to buy any assets. You're just creating a game. And then from there, you can quickly monetize it as well, both with your own assets or someone else's. And also our intent is that, that uh, you, you won't actually make any money by just using your own assets. That pool is there regardless, so you're actually incentivized to collaborate with 3D modelers and artists. So also key is that asset ownership stays with you, and we're managing the licensing side. So of course, doing all this piecemeal is how a lot of the industry works right now, or you might be on an, a store that manages that licensing, but the advantage of being an all-in-one platform is that we manage that because you just upload the assets if you're the modeler, for example, and then the licensing between the developer and you is all managed through the mirror. So truly an all-in-one platform. So with that, very importantly, is that you can now monetize anything. That could be a Godot scene, that could be a GLB, that could be a GD script, a shader, more. That could be a, the car you create, as another example. You upload that, and that's a full component that someone could pull down and put into their game, and then everyone makes money when a premium player plays the game from there. And very key, so you don't need to full, launch a full game in order to monetize, and we want the mirror to be an ultimate collaborative sandbox that you can build in. We are also working on our own first party game as well. And so if we say it's a great platform, we're not just gonna say that, we're actually gonna build something on it. So uh, this is a working title, but it's inspired by Red Faction and Gary's Mod, because we have awesome physics, which I'll chat more about shortly. Uh, so we built the game dev platform, so now we wanna make an awesome game with it. So more details to come. We haven't really posted much online other than you might see some of our sci-fi assets, and that's because we wanna give you a lot of these assets that you can just create games with from there. So again, also not just dogfooding our technical product, but also our business model on just, as far as the RevShare side. 
This brings us to physics. Uh, we posted this on Twitter slash X recently. And so we are finishing up Networked Jolt Physics, which is extremely hard to do. Uh, it's taken us five plus months to integrate it. Now, just running Jolt Physics by itself isn't too bad. Again, it's the network side that gets very complicated. And so it's working great. And so we said, hey, we'll put this in there. And then now you get it for free. You can just build games quickly with it. You can create something small in Godot. And then quickly, you have full-blown Network Jolt Physics with that. So we've been working very hard on this for the past 18 months. Uh, it's been a huge technical lift. And uh, I put a uh, fictional Dr. Feynman quote here. But with that, uh, the reason for the F is because our F release will be coming with Networked Physics. And that will be coming next month. We'll be releasing on the Epic Games Store to start for our open alpha. Now, we actually did a soft launch and um, put it on the website. So you can download our previous release right now, actually. It's just um, we wanted to get some trickle and feedback, got some rough edges that we're always open to feedback on that we are definitely polishing as well. But we'd love for you to check it out on Epic Games next month. And then we'll be doing a Steam launch sometime next year. But as we all very well know, that needs to be very well planned and well timed. So uh, on the game dev side, we badly need an auto updater. So this was a reason for us going with the Epic Games sort of start. And then we'll go with Steam later on. And then another thing, too, if you enjoy making games, especially with good music, we would love to collaborate with you. Privately, we're in some talks with some uh, popular artists who love to get into the gaming space. And so in the same way that we are kind of mediating that relationship for assets, we are in talks with some artists who would love to work with some game devs to build in the mirror and they'll license their music to you to use for your games in the mirror. So if you're interested, uh, shoot me an email, reach out on x slash Twitter, or just pull me aside here. With that, thank you so much on my end. Um, really appreciate you all coming. And I will hand this over to Mr. Wojtek Pei. Wojtek, as I mentioned, is, I'm biased, of course. I'm absolutely one of the best graphics artists I've ever seen in the world, because I saw his YouTube videos. A lot of you have, too. So very excited to have him speaking here. Thank you. So thank you, Jared. So my name is Wojciech Piliszek, and you probably may know me as a Wojtek P from my YouTube. Uh, this is some of my previous works, and I hopefully you may recognize. Uh, I am a senior developer of the Mirror. I'm mostly focusing on graphic stuff, uh, rendering, um, but usually I just goes in game dev, so sometimes I'm jumped to like stuff like UI, uh, physics, and uh, networking. Uh, so this is like a quick showcase that's what we are currently working on and what kind of like visuals I'm working on. So some kind of systems that, for example, you know, grass aligned to a terrain uh, that you can you know, easily modify with the shaders, some uh, vegetation tests that we did, and we are still improving on this. Uh, also, like, really nice, you know, terrains, materials uh, that, yeah, we really wanted to bring to Godot. And this is the, like my favorite part, like favorite scene that we are using, like the winter scene with, where you know full team are you know playing our playtests. So I want to also quickly mention why we using Godot, for, like from the developer perspective, like you know in the bigger team. So uh, main reason is actually you know big community of knowledgeable people. But I'm not speaking about like a user that are using Godot. I'm speaking about like contributors. So this is like you know special case for the open source software. We actually have a lot of people that know like you know uh, the source code of the engine itself. So in case of like issues and you know. Basically, if you have any kind of question, there's a lot of people that can help you or like at least direct you in the correct direction. Also, because of the like open source nature in Godot, uh, we have like a high level of customization. So uh, what it means is that we have like a custom soft fork of Godot, and we basically can merge PRs that are not yet merged or maybe never be merged to Godot, but you know we need them, and they like specific targeting our use case, and we don't have an issue with that. So. We also can contribute back, of course, and create our own PRs, which is, you know, pretty nice and probably hard to find in like closed software engines. Um, a bit our about our code base. So we are mostly writing in GDScript, and uh, we have 65,000 lines of code currently. So I checked last week, and so this should be like mostly up to date. Uh, critical parts are written in C++, so things that are needs to be you know, re re real time or like complex algorithms, uh, those things we move to C++. Uh, for shaders, we are mostly using GD shaders. Uh, we didn't have uh, like a need to actually modify GLSL so far, 
this I don't remember. So this is great because we don't have any you know conflicts with the main line Godot at this at this site. Uh, speaking about the backend, so we are using TypeScript and Python, and that's mostly what I know about it. So yeah, um, custom Godot fork, uh, as I mentioned before. Uh, yeah, so we need this for some PRs that are you know not merged. So we are developing ourselves. And of course, we integrate with other services like you know for authorization, storage, server scaling, but also things like you know nice avatars for users that can use uh, that they can use in their game. So yeah, we use a lot of GD scripts. So you probably you know interested how you know it's, it, what about the performance and does it matter or is it slower? So generally, yeah, I mean GD script is probably you know a bit slower than other languages, but it's really fast in like iterating your algorithms and solutions. So it's very fast to write. And uh, we write a lot of the script. And in case of performance issue, we you know, start to profile it. And uh, we analyze the slow parts of our code base. And uh, we move you know, inefficient code to the C side. So we only move some small parts of GD script that is actually slow. Uh, and by doing that, we have like you know pretty reasonable performance and really f you know devel fast development loop because we can really fastly you know change things w without waiting for any you know for any compilations and stuff like that. So it's like trying to bring you know the best of both worlds, like performance and like fast of, you know, speed of development. Um, so. We have a lot of networking challenges, as Jared mentioned before. So, besides like standard optimization that you know Godot provides, which are you know pretty basic so far, but they they do their job. Uh, we also you know we we are a network platform, so we need to like stream uh, network assets, and uh, we have like plans actually to like you know move to the CDN based solutions. So we have like LOD based on, on the like CDN. Uh, and also, like Jarrett mentioned, we have like you know network physics, which was really challenging. So, on this video, you can see a lot of rigid bodies that are you know play in real time. So there are actually both clients you know running at the same time and seeing the same thing. Which not sure how many of you try to do this in Godot with like standard Godot physics or like even with Jolt, but it's pretty hard. <laughs> and uh, we have a Jolt integration, and probably you you know. A lot of you heard about Jolt, but we are actually not using the Jolt GD, uh, GD extension plugin. We have our low-level implementation, and uh, this is because we are targeting, you know, this network uh, network synchronization. And uh, yeah, so basically, we can avoid like uh, conversions of type from Godot to Jolt. We can use direct, you know type from Jolt. and things like that. You know, makes uh, a lot of ch you know changes in the performance. Um, so yeah, I wanted like uh, as an artist, like you know, visual artist, I want to mention why you know I, I believe that you know learning the mirror will help you you know learn Godot, and uh, other way. And so if you like a uh, you know visual artist that know Godot, uh, you can actually use uh, the mirror, and it, it will you know fasten your workflow. So usually when you are a visual ar visual artist, uh, what you do is when you want to create some kind of shader or like you know present your assets, you basically create a new project, you import these assets, and you know you start to modify your shader a and that's okay, but uh, you know it's best to showcase your world in like proper environment like you know uh, that you know it's fitting and uh, the mirror provides you tools to you know, basically make this work faster. So you can focus on those things that are interesting to you. And uh, yeah, so we have, you know, tools like maps. Uh, we have like a basic presets of environments. Of course, you can tweak them. So for example, we have like uh, templates for the uh, canyons, for the desert, for the Mars template. And you have like a terrain. Uh, you have like uh, ambient sounds. You know, we have a player controller. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can of course tweak it later if you want, but it's just so fast to you know create the space and just bring your asset there. Uh, so yeah, also as I mentioned, we provide you you know player co control and camera. So not many people like you know think about it, but w when you want to like show like asset for a game, it's really nice to show it's actually in a game. So this is like out of the box in the mirror. And uh, if you are bringing the assets to the mirror, they have like you know nice improvements. Like uh, you know it's just 
everything is like automatically generated with the collision. So if you bring the, you know, for example, a box to a ward, uh, you can just click one button in the inspector settings and you can shoot at it with a gun and it will start moving, for example. And it's, you know, network synchronized. So it's really fun to use. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, material library. So this is like my favorite part. <laughs> so basically in standard Godot workflow, so when you want to like bring a material to your asset, for example, so you need to go to the PBR website, you need to download the zip, you extract those files, you bring them to the Godot, you create standard material, you tweak those settings in standard material, uh, you apply to the mesh, and uh, you know, in the end, it may be that it's not really satisfying. So you need to do those steps again and again. And uh, yeah, since we are lazy because we are programmers <laughs> and you know artists, we usually uh, just you know want to make this work faster. And in the mirror, it's really easy because we have like a great library, so you can basically choose from uh, like thousands of materials, and just by clicking them, and you just select the best textures and just tweak them later. So you don't like uh, you know. Uh, leave it like this is good enough. No, you can very fastly change it. So you, you, you achieve this way the best results, at least in my opinion, of course. And uh, we're bringing uh, the compatibility with the Godot shaders. That's why I mentioned this is like really good tool for people that want to learn Godot and other way around, because you can basically write the same thing. Uh, so GD shaders from Godot will work in the mirror and GD shaders from the mirror will work in the Godot. So yeah. Just, it's just faster to use them in the mirror because of those tools. Uh, yeah, and we of course might have like a mirror library, uh, which is you know quite decent already. And thanks to RefShare, we like you know hope that it will grow with each day. So yeah, this is quite interesting topic. So GLTF. So uh, our pipeline asset is actually based around it, and this is you know not like specific topic to the mirror. It's actually general in the Godot itself that uh, GLTF is a great tool uh, if you want to import some like more complex information from other software to your game engine. So people when hear GLTF usually you know think about like modeling software, you bring your meshes, textures, animations to like game engine. So that's true but actually GLTF can contain a lot of more information. Uh, so you can, for example, you know, bring lights, and yeah, like you have a car with lights, or you know, like uh, a lamp or something. Uh, but uh, there are more cool things, like you can actually, you know, uh, export from the Godot itself collision shapes in the GLTF file. And actually, if you create a rigid body and assign the collisions to it and export it as a GLTF and import it again, this is, you know, again a rigid body. So like body type is also preserved. Um, yeah, also GLTF supports custom extensions, so you can integrate a lot of cool stuff that you need. So for example, we have like extension for equ equipables, uh, and one of those is like a gun. So you can, you know, use uh, some properties like a firing rate, like, you know, hands position or like shooting sound and, and things like that. And what's great about it is that the data is connected to the mesh and it's actually not stored on our server independently of your, you know, artwork. And uh, this makes it so, you know, you are the owner of this data. And if you want to use it in other solution, you basically can write, a, you know, GD, in GD script, uh, some code that is, you know, extracting this extension data and use it in your game without our platform. That's, you know, that, that's, I believe that, you know, this is a really important part uh, of the GLTF. It's portab portable. And uh, yeah, so I mentioned maps, and this is like quite interesting topic. So we, we actually, you know, experimented a lot, and we didn't really, we weren't really satisfied with any solution so far. So we wanted to provide something for the user that is, you know, quick and works. Uh, so we decided actually to create something we call maps, which is basically like an optimized heat map renderer. And the workflow is like we, you know, use like this procedural generated tool like Gaia. Uh, to actually generate really looking, really nice looking realistic terrains, uh, we export them like you know, as a height maps maps, and we bring them to the mirror, uh, and basically we apply custom material on top of that. So you can see like some features of these materials. Like we have like uh, screen space, normal maps, uh, you know, differentiates. 
uh, of the layer heights. We have like real time editing. Uh, we also showcase here like materials that I mentioned before and how easy it is for the artist to use it. And basically, you know, uh, you, you can basically choose the best material possible. And that way, you, you achieve the best visible possible results, in, in speaking about visuals. Yeah, and this is like some examples of uh, those um, techniques. Like, you know, you see that two were created by artists and the third one is like a rug on the terrain. So, yeah, there's a lot of flexibility if you think about it. Uh, yeah, so also shader works. Uh, so this is one of my recent uh, topics that I was interested in. And uh, yeah, I created this like surface level shader for water. Uh, and uh, you maybe know or not, but if you want like a nice reflection on the water, it's pretty hard to do it in Godot. Um, you have few ways of doing that. Like for example, you can use reflection prop, or you can, for example, but yeah, reflection prop has this issue that well, the reflection aren't always in the correct place, or they like like a bit blurry, or like you know, standard reflection prop issues. And uh, you can also use SDG SDFGI. But you know, first of all, it's expensive. And second, it's not doing sharp reflections on transparent objects. And first solution, which I thought that will work, is the screen space reflections in Godot. But it turns out that they don't work actually with the alpha transparent objects. Uh, so what is you know the solution? So I thought that well, how hard would it be to modify the engine itself to you know implement screen space reflections to the water surface and only to the water surface? And uh, it turns out that you don't even need to modify the engine. So you can write your own screen space reflections in the material shader. And by doing that, uh, you, you have like a pseudo code here that, you know, it doesn't look so complex. There are some, you know, you know, functions that they're hidden, but basically this is like basic shader stuff. And by doing that, you can achieve, you know, results that is similar to what you can see on the screen right now. So I believe this is, you know, pretty interesting that, you know, the Godot shaders are such powerful tools. So, uh, also, yeah, we have like a, a bit weird use case in the mirror where we have like a players and creators. So we kind of need to scale the quality for both of them. So yeah, I will yeah, quickly skip over this slide because probably we don't have much time. But uh, yeah, so generally, if you're the player, you want to scale the quality of the effects. But if you're the creator, creator you want to actually you know scale the like what kind of effects are enabled. So similar stuff that we have in Godot, but we also have the player that we need to you know include in this like quality settings. Uh, so here are a few examples in the Godot that actually you may be interested in. So first of all, uh, the, the fog one. Uh, so the default fog settings in the Godot, I would say, do not produce the best visual results. They are targeting more like a lower end devices. So on the top one, you can see those blurry shapes, which is you know the the thing that we get out of the box in Godot. And the, on the bottom one, this is actually the same place in the world, the same you know scene, the same in the same time. It's just the difference in the quality settings in the Godot. So. Main challenge here is like finding those settings and knowing how to tweak. So, for example, you may be interested in trying to disable filtering and increasing other settings. And yeah, I mean, a lot of people are afraid of doing that, but yeah, you you, you can try. And I believe me, you will see like interesting results. Also, SDFGI. So, if you have a dark scene with a lot of like emissive lights, you, it may be that you may want to actually increase the ray count. This is expensive operation, but if the users can run it on the hardware, you know, it really in improves the visual quality for them because uh, otherwise, when you move in the, you know, the space, dark space with emissive flights, everything could be flickery. So by increasing the number of ray counts, you basically blend those colors together, especially of you know, small emissive uh, you know, objects. Uh, yeah, so we hope that you know SDFGI will be improved in the next releases of Godot. But uh, for right now, this is like solution that you know work at least for the high-end devices. And uh, also, you know, I, I don't hear about it a lot in Godot community, so I wanted to speak about you know the bugging visual side of the mirror. But generally speaking, any kind of application uh, written in Godot. So. 
Uh, as you may know, do we have like a new tab since Godot 4, in, like it's for the visual debugging. You can see some kind of like uh, information about your passes that are currently there, but you may need actually a bit more information. So if you want to know what's you know going under the hood, the Godot, uh, and you know you know interested in where like you know there are like. The, the biggest you know register usage for example in, in your shaders you, you may be interested in tools that depending on the vendor it's like radian developer tool suit for uh, amd cards and i believe nvidia uh, site for you know nvidia cards and those two will you know tell you a lot and you actually will learn a lot about uh, how godot actually render things and how it is optimized so you may find out that nowadays godot is doing batching so you know not always it may be so beneficial to actually create multi meshes i think that it's still probably beneficial in a lot of situations but i'm uh, this means that you know uh, the godot is trying to do it by itself out of the box so you you, you can focus on you know other things um, yeah, at least in theory. <laughs> uh, and the other tool that is pretty interesting is called uh, RenderDog. And this tool is, you know, really great if you check, like, recent uh, PRs regarding compositor effects, for example. Uh, those are, like, a custom, you know, those pipeline steps that you can add. Um, and uh, it will allow you to basically inspect uh, all the textures that are using in your uh, in your shader, all the inputs, and uh, you know we can inspect draw calls and things like that. So uh, Godot doesn't provide you right now with you know such low-level tools. So if you want to you know develop this more complex rendering scenarios, I really recommend checking those two tools. Uh, yeah. So yeah, since we are also quite a big project, so I believe that you know testing is really important. So I wanted to you know mention a few things that how we do it, it in the mirror. So for unit tests we are using GAT, and since we are like a very networked heavy platform, uh, we try to write our code so you know there are no dependencies during you know, running unit tests to the networking side. But it's not always possible. So GAT is providing you really cool mechanisms, for example, for stabbing some network classes. So basically you can replace some. Uh, functions that are connected to, for example, outside servers, and by doing that, you can, you know, encapsulate your test on your local machine, which is really important because you don't want your test to be dependent on the outside servers. I mean, at least you need tests um, because we have integration tests too, and those are written in our custom solution. You know, basically, this is like custom scripts, GD shader scripts, uh, but uh, we want to move to GAT, at least we, you know, considering it. And those uh, tests are used to basically uh, analyze any kind of, uh, kind of API differences between our backend and frontend. So uh, we are running our tests on CI. So uh, if, you know, backend team makes some changes for API, uh, we, you know, or detect it on the PR stage because, you know, we will not merge something that is breaking API. So it's like save our time. And also, uh, you know, front-end site, which is Godot in our case, uh, it, it, it can work without any disturbances because, uh, you know, it, it may break some things for, for like developers doing their work. Uh, yeah, so I believe that's, you know, I wanted to speak about. Uh, not sure how much time we have, but yeah. Uh, since you were talking about uh, that it's all read time, uh, how do you handle when, uh, for example, the user is creating a script and uh, there's an error in the code, like the from the user? Uh, so we have like a system of showing basically which block is not executing. A lot of scripts uh, are actually you know, executed first on the server side. So it's like it's not executing for you, it's not executing for anyone. So basically, yeah, the clients only replicate the state of the server. Um, I'm really curious. You mentioned two things. Uh, first of all, um, people like artists making, uploading their, their assets or whatever, and still 
owning them, but then you also said it's really easy to get your game out of the mirror into Godot. And I'm wondering, like, obviously you're handling like the relationship between the artist and the game maker and the player who is paying probably. I, I, it feels kind of complicated for me to afterwards for the game dev then say, I want to get all these assets into my Godot game that are belonging to someone and I don't know them because you're handling all the relationships. Yes, that's a very good point. And so ultimately that you have to have a direct relationship with the artist and then actually buy the assets to export it out or like have some kind of setup there. Yeah. And we're trying to, you're right, we're trying to simplify that for you so you can hit the ground running, but you're right, the export process would be, you're doing a lot of that from scratch. Yeah, really interesting project. I really like it. Is there any support for web or HTML clients? That is planned. Uh, we're extremely excited about that, actually. But um, yeah, WebGPU would be the main blocker there. Uh, we were trying to think about it with the current render, but just wasn't really up to it. Um, also, UDP in the browser is still pretty fledgling early. Um, there's some good progress with it, though. But that'd be something we have to look into pretty seriously. So short answer is yes. It's just a question mark of when. Uh, really great talk. Um, I really love the more technical insight uh, into the mirror now as well. Um, what stood to me out really uh, was uh, the going in and going out of the mirror that is this open is to me really makes the project really much more excited than it was before in my mind. Um, uh, yeah, this is really awesome. The thing that confused me the most was about the monetization. I did not understand it at all. Uh, the huge question mark for me as well was like the 80-20 split. Um, I don't understand it at all. Game developers is mostly creating assets. Um, so I would love to a bit more um, insight in that. Is that sorry? Is that something you like? Did you do you uh, as a company uh, decide that split, or is that something like the game developer or the team can decide themselves? Yeah, great question. The, the question was, how do we determine that split and then everything else from there? Um, work in progress because that, like, we've heard feedback on both sides of like, okay, that's really good as far as, maybe it's the bias of where you're coming from of, well, it's really the game development that takes a lot of time or it's really the artistry. So it's not finalized. That's the short answer. So love to chat more about it. Um, that'd be really helpful. Yeah, will you be supporting tool development as well in the same model, or how does that work? As they're not generally not exported with the project. Sorry, did you say tool development? Yeah. Um, as far as a tool script. Yeah, tool script or plugins or those kind of things. That wouldn't be on the roadmap just yet. Um, open to it in the future, though. But that'd get pretty. Because like, we'd have to get that to work with our net code as well, to sync everything. That's where the complexity would come in. Uh, but at the same time, like on a kind of a business relationship side, if there's one, like a plugin you really are excited about, or maybe you authored it, we're most happy to chat. Hey, yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, so this rev share, that's between the the person who's building the game and then the artists who've already submitted stuff. Um, can you share what your rev share is? Because I assume you're taking a percentage to earn money on the platform. Correct. So we're looking at 30% for a pool to start. Um, and that's similar to market rates right now. Um, you know, Steam is 30%. Uh, I'm not an editor for Fortnite. is actually 40. Uh, we'd love to increase that in the future, but you know, we're, we're a young startup, so working on it. Oh, no, no, increase the payout that we give as a portion of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, kind of related to this, uh, I know this is like a networking development, like it's supposed to, you develop it with others together, right? And that's the main goal. But it's still uh, curious to me, like, who owns this project? Like, if someone decides they want to go out, like, is there, is there a point where I say, okay, I'm starting a project and now I'm inviting all of you, but I'm the owner, or is it owned by you and we're just using your platform to collaborate on something on your, uh, that belongs to you? I don't know, that's, uh, I'm curious. Yeah, short, short answer is we want you to own it. Uh, we're not trying to like say, hey, this is ours now. Like, that is your project fully. Um, and you can invite, you know, other Game Dev Grant and Game Dev Glory to come collaborate with you. But that, that'll be left up to you. Ultimately, we're the platform, it's your game.
Yeah, again me. So, I have a question about the structure of files in the project. Because in Unity there's a lot of meta files, but in Godot it's very transparent and clean. What about this? How it's all organized? Well, so for starter, uh, it really depends because we are kind of different platform. We are like more space defined, so we have like a still work in progress structure of actual assets. But for now, uh, you you have like a, the assets that you have on the space that are belonging to the space. Well, sp the space is just like we, we call this the, the, se the scene from the Godot, and uh, you have like a community share of like assets that are there, and uh, you have your own assets. You you have like of, of course privilege based system we can share between other clients, uh, but uh, we we don't have like a file structure system for our you know users. Uh, per se, so yeah, because I understand you like comparing you know, the project in the mirror to the project in the Godot, yeah. So it, it works a bit different because we try to simplify those things to like you know, new users. So basically, we're like you know asset based, and we have everything tagged by like, categories by stuff, and user just brings you know those things to the to the space. And more advanced users, of course, can write you know their own assets like that and share them to other users. Uh, but yeah, basically right now we are like relying on tagging, uh, and we are considering actually some changes to like you know introducing like a proper hierarchy of uh, file system, but uh, we're still not sure to be honest at this point. Uh, I've been also really impressed by um, the uh, Jolt integration you showed off uh, earlier. And uh, I was wondering how do you, if you can share any details about how you solved the uh, determinism and you know mirroring like similar states. Uh, well, uh, yeah. So I am not the you know physics guy here. I am the you know visual guy. But uh, from you know what I understand, we like using like replaying state of the physics, basically. So um, this is like done like some kind of network synchronizer plugin, I believe. Uh, but yeah, for more information, uh, I'm not the person I need to ask about that. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for the talk.